I've been doing uh, a lot of research lately and in a lot of Bible study, and I'm, I've had it up to here with theologians. I really have. I've had it up to here with scholars. I've had it up to here with theologians. These people play with the text over and over and over, and they never meet Jesus. They argue on dates and reasonings and meanings, and they never meet Jesus. And so we can talk about what the Bible says on spiritual warfare, and I can give you the verses, but I'd much rather give you a practical application of how do I confront this force and this power that is trying to influence my life, and how do we defeat it? So uh, tonight I call it the art of war. And uh, what is so important about war is knowing your enemy. Now, I've given you all the biblical and the theological understanding of who the devil is, who the fallen angels are, who the demons are, how they operate and how they work. But how do we deal with them practically? And so I want to share with you a quote from uh, Sun Tzu, uh, who wrote The Art of War. I don't know if you, anybody here familiar with The Art of War, the book The Art of War. A couple of you. Okay, this is an ancient, ancient Chinese book, uh, and uh, it was written by uh, a master, uh, mastermind warrior and leader of an ancient army in China. Uh, you can get it free off the internet, download it. Uh, I studied it just for the tactics of warfare, and it's fascinating. And there's a lot that ties in with Scripture. But he said this, and this is very true. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know how the enemy operates, and what does Paul say about him? He's got no new tactics. We know the schemes of the enemy. If you know your enemy, ah, but here's the other one, and you know yourself. Because he goes on and says, if you know yourself but not the enemy, every victory gained, you'll suffer a defeat as well. If you know neither the enemy or yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Identity, identity, identity. You need to understand who the enemy is and you need to understand who you are. You can know who the enemy is, but if you don't know who you are, he'll trip you up every time. If you know who you are but don't know the enemy, he's got a way to get around your ignorance. And if we don't know enough about each other, we're getting beat up all the time. And I'm afraid there's a lot of Christians who are getting beat up a lot of times. Now let me read to you what Paul said. Paul said this, So, no, so now it is no longer I who do it, do what? Sin, fail. But sin that dwells within me, for I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Paul is identifying the enemy within himself, let alone the enemy on the outside of us, which is the devil. There's an inner enemy called the flesh. Our body, our desires, our lusts, our minds, uh, what we've carried in as lies and, and woundedness, all within this flesh. Our spirit is immediately born again, sanctified. Our soul, which is our intellect, emotion, and will, is being transformed and renewed. The one thing that won't be is this container we're in. And this container still causes us problems we call it the flesh and that's where sin dwells it's where it tempts us it's where it's clawing for us it's where it's broken and bruised and wanting to be fed and there's a war that goes on and what was important is Paul identifies the war going on between his flesh and his spirit man and an external enemy if the enemy can tempt the flesh then the flesh will do what it wants and we're going to end up doing what we don't want. You have to learn how to identify who you are in Christ. Paul says in chapter 8, my inner man delights in the law of God. That's his spirit man. 
How many of you here know in your heart of hearts, in the depth of your spirit, you delight in God, who he is, you want to serve him? How many of you want to live a righteous life? How many of you desire that? Right? You know that. God knows that. That's the true you in Jesus Christ. Don't forget it. Don't forget that. That's who you are in Christ. And Paul purposely separates himself from that which is no good in him that is in my flesh. Do you see how he qualified it? There's nothing good in me, but he qualifies it. That is in my flesh. Because there's something good in me, it's the Holy Spirit. And there's something good in me, the Holy Spirit, who's trying to redeem my identity. But it's in this container, the flesh, and that's where I have to separate myself from. And there's an enemy that's trying to tempt my flesh to get me to do the things I don't want to do. But there's a spirit of God within me that is giving me strength to resist the temptation and overcome the flesh. This is gospel 101, people. This is Bible 101, right? And we forget. I forget. I can teach it, but I run into this problem all the time. It's me, right? So the key to overcoming these attacks is identify. Identify your enemy. Identify the enemy. Identify who you are. Know who you are and know who he is. Know where the source of this trouble is coming from. Because we all have temptation. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now the proper rendering of that is deliver us from the evil one. There is an evil one we need deliverance from. We're asking God that we wouldn't be led by that evil one into temptation. Don't allow us, God, the Holy Spirit, don't allow us to be led into temptation. See, you defeat the enemy before he even strikes. If I am able to overcome my flesh and not even be able to go into temptation, the things that used to tempt us. Has anybody got one thing that you overcame, you no longer are tempted by? Isn't it a good thing? Thank God, I'm free. He waves that in front of your head and you're going like, come on, really? I've been around that thing so long, I don't even bother to go back down that way. But there are other things that still draw and entice us and we've got to understand. David said, I have to learn how to hate sin. I need to hide your word in my heart so that I will not sin against you. And so if I've got a word of love, a word of promise from God, and something's tempting to take that away from me, no, I don't want that. So identify the sources. That's what we have to do. Number one, we have to identify the root of the problem because what the problem is many times is deeper than what the situation has stirred up. We'll go into each one of these. The second is, I need to identify what's speaking to me right now. What is speaking to me? Who is speaking to me? And thirdly, I need to take an action. A lot of us go through one and two and we never do number three. We never take action. We Pentecostals want God to take the action. You do it. Take it away from me requires us to take action. So let's go through each one of these, okay? Tonight's a training session. All right. Jesus said this about the Holy Spirit. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Now, when was the Holy Spirit coming? Uh, For each one of us personally at salvation, that's a great answer. It happened after the cross, death, and resurrection of Jesus. He ascended to heaven on the day of Pentecost. The Spirit was poured out to all who believe. But I like what you said. Personally, for each one of us, the Spirit comes to us at our salvation. So you being saved now has the Holy Spirit in you. And what does the promise that the Holy Spirit will do? Guide you into all truth. He says, I'll make you believe all truth. That's not what he says. I'll guide you into all truth. I'll force you to believe truth. It's not what he says. I'll guide you to truth. I'll let you see the truth, 
right? He'll guide us. He'll lead us. But we have to obey and follow to what is true. How many of you have known something to be true and you still did the other thing? Okay, every hand up. Right? So the Holy Spirit, he is called the parakletos. That's the Greek for him, paraklete. One called alongside of. And so the Holy Spirit is called alongside of us as an advocate, advocatus, the one who defends us, the one who walks with us, the one who counsels us and guides us. But he never takes over our will because he's training us, teaching us to walk in obedience to him. All right, so first of all, let's learn to listen to the Holy Spirit. So when he talks to us, we respond. And we've ignored that voice too many times. The older you get, the less you want to go around that mountain again. I'm tired of going around that mountain. I'm going to listen to the voice this time and get used to listening. Now let's take a listen here. So what is the root of the problem? Identify what's going on. What's happening in my life that's causing turmoil, that's causing strife? Can you identify what's wrong? And so I, I ask you, you know, in your own mind, in your own heart right now, is there something agitating you? Is there something oppressing you? Is there something that's on you? Okay? I, I'm, I'm going to make a scenario here, okay? Uh, COVID. Could have went for the election, but I am not going there. Let's go to COVID. COVID, okay? So that's the problem. There's COVID, okay? So let's, let's figure this out. What's happening in my life? COVID, all right? But does it go deeper than a disease, a virus that's out there? What is impacting you? Identify it. Take time. This is going to take time to pray. Let the Spirit guide you. What's the problem with COVID? Well, I feel isolated, I'm not getting the fellowship I need. I'm not getting relationship that I need. I, I, I'm not able to get out and, and just mingle and be with people and talk to people. That's bothering me. Okay? How about fear? Starting to have this fear and this sense, should I touch that door handle or not? Who got COVID? Oh no, Cousin Joe. I saw him a week ago. If I get COVID, that means I can't see my kids, and I can't see my grandkids, and I can't see, oh, I do, this is horrible. Okay, so search out the problem. I don't want to. I get all agitated. Well, how are we going to get to the root of it if we don't identify it? Right? So let's identify it. You're walking there with the Holy Spirit. So what's the problem? Is it go deeper than what it appears? This happens a lot of times when there's an emotional reaction way more than the situation. You ever have that happen? Right? Oops, I'm sorry, I spilled my milk. What do you mean you spilled the milk? How could you spill the milk? You always spill the milk. Hmm. That seems a little bit deeper than the milk issue. That's what I'm thinking. So let's go deeper, right? I mean, you know, you're in your house and, and there's water dripping from the ceiling. Hmm, there's a leak somewhere. Okay, I've got to solve the problem. I know what the problem is. I'll put a piece of tape over the leak. No, they make this tape now. You've seen the commercials. You can put tape under water. I'll put that tape right there. And how many of us do this? <laughs> I've been to your house. No, really, how many? With our own deep-seated problems, we've got a drip going on, and we put a piece of tape over it. Right? So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to cut a hole in the ceiling and find out what's going on. So you cut a hole in the ceiling and you see, oh my gosh, there's a lot of water there. So then you investigate and you recognize, you know what? The bathtub is right above here. So let's go take a look at the bathtub. So, okay, there's the bathtub. Now what? I got to get back by the pipes to see what's going on in the bathtub we got to get into our pipes, find out what's going on with this dripping in my head that's causing me nuts. 
So you open it up and you look, ah, okay, we got a little deeper, we dug it deeper. Uh, the one uh, uh, off switch, right, the, the switch for the water off and on is dripping. It's got an old seal, we've got to fix that. I'm using that analogy to say we have to identify what the problem is. And many times we quit too soon on identifying what the problem is. And the enemy has a heyday. Many times the problem will go back to deeper issues. The reason I am so fearful of COVID is because maybe I lost my mom or my dad to a sickness or a disease many years ago. And that anytime I have these issues, it really scares me. Am I going to die that way? Is this going to be? See, there's usually deeper root things that the enemy's playing on and your flesh has developed triggers for that from echoes of what's been wounded before. And so we ask, Holy Spirit, take me to where the damage is. Holy Spirit, lead me. Assess what the problem is. So we've got to see. Now, sometimes you can find out that it is a spiritual problem. Sometimes it's an emotional problem from the past. Uh, sometimes it's an assault from an enemy, the devil. And he's just playing on your frazzled emotions, and he's getting in. It could have been from sin issues that you had exposed yourself to or any other reason. But let's identify what the problem is. That's first, and don't quit on it too soon. Secondly, see, uh, I'm, I'm gonna, let me go back for a minute because the, the tape on the ceiling was a good point. Because you really didn't do that, did you, Dean? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm too fascinated now. I just <laughs> but again, we're such an informationally based culture. How many infomercials? I still get sucked into this. I don't know about you. They are so good at infomercials. I listen to an infomercial and I think, geez, maybe I should sign up for that. That sounds pretty cool. To have that, you know, all I have to do is listen to these tapes and I got this thing under my belt, man. I, don't, I might do that. And it's such a scam. But we even fall into it where even in our Christian books, you know, seven reasons why you can have this overcoming life or five easy lessons to do this and how to quit that. And we're so apt to do those things, put tape on the problem instead of spending quality time in the Holy Spirit and prayer. We've all but forsaken what the Holy Spirit can do to us in a revelation moment. We've got to get back to, to, to meditating on God and inviting Him into every opportunity. There are a number of different ways to have God respond in your prayer. And uh, I'm trying to remember the one guy's name, and I can't remember it, so I'm just going to skip it. But what he says is this, is he will pray about something and he asks the Holy Spirit, through any means possible today, speak to me. And so... He's put that out to the Holy Spirit, and so he expects then to watch and listen. Could be a song on the radio, could be something someone says to him during the day, could be something he read in a magazine, could be something his boss told him to go do, whatever, and boom, when it hits, he knows it. But he's gearing himself to hear from God. Okay, Now we can do that with books and, and of course with scripture and stuff. So what I'm saying is, we have to identify the problem, and so often we never identify what the true problem is. And many times we'll just, I rebuke the devil and we go on, but you didn't deal with anything. We didn't go any deeper. So the art of war is to learn the situation. There's a story of a great general. He was brought up for court martial, and I can't remember if it was Hacksaw Ridge or one of these uh, situations where they were sent into battle and during the battle they were losing horribly. Uh, the American troops were losing terribly. And uh, he was reported at one point in the battle, one of the soldiers saw him and he, the, the main general was sitting at a tree, under a tree, 
we're being defeated right now in a battle and you're sitting under a tree. And when they brought him forward for the court martial, they said, what are you doing? You were, you were caught sitting there. He said, I was evaluating the situation. He said, there are three things I always ask, three questions I always ask. Uh, what is happening right now? What is not happening right now? And what needs to happen right now? That's an assessment. Instead of immediately responding to what happens, he's saying, what is happening? Evaluate that. But what is not happening that should be happening? And apply it. So I just want to make sure this is big. For many of us, please, don't kick the can down the road. Don't just ignore it. Don't just let it go again. Don't just blame it on the enemy. Begin to ask the Holy Spirit, what is the root to my problem? What is the root to my fear? What is the root to my anger? What is the root to my marital stress? What is the root to my problem with other people? What is the root to my inferiority that I have? What is the root to my continual lust for food or for whatever gratification? What is the root of this God? And don't quit till he begins to tear out the drywall covering your pipes. I don't know if that's a good analogy or not. <laughs> Second, what voice is speaking? This is huge. All right. Typically, in any situation, you record your history and your experience with a particular voice. Now, how many of you have that self-loathing voice? You're such an idiot. You're such a jerk. I do. Does anybody else have this problem? All right, some of you don't. Some people don't even have, there are some folks who don't have a voice, an inner voice, reasoning. I, I didn't realize that, but that's true. Some folks, some folks don't have an inner voice that says, oh, you shouldn't have done that, or you should have done that, or maybe you could do that. Yeah. All right, so we have to figure out what is the voice. If it is a condemning voice, if it's a voice saying, God can't love you, and it's condemning, not convicting. If it's a voice convicting, we can count on the Holy Spirit who's going to convict and point out that was wrong. You shouldn't have done that. I, di I had that happen to me just the other day. I, when I leave to go home for work, I go drive down Church Street. And there's about five or six stop signs that are absolutely unnecessary, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> And many times, I do the rolling stop. And uh, the other day, I was just preoccupied, and I went, and there was another car that came right to the stop sign, and I did my rolling stop. And the guy rolled down his window, and he had some very colorful things to say to me. And it showed me some hand signals and all sorts of stuff. And I was really offended. I thought, why is he being so mean to me? My goodness. And then the conviction, yeah, I had to play the scene back because I couldn't figure out, what did I do? And I'm just turning left right in front of him. What's the problem? And then halfway down the block, I realized I just blew through that stop sign. I deserved what that guy did. That was a conviction. And I, I felt bad. I repented. I, I didn't chase the guy down. But I mean, before the Lord, I said, Lord, I did. you know what? I, I've been playing too loose and f free with those stop signs. I can get myself in trouble or somebody else hurt. But I had a conviction over it. But I didn't have a condemnation. Now, the driver condemned me. <laughs> he condemned me. But I have had other situations where I've had that condemning voice. When you are being condemned for something, who is typically the source? Satan, when you are being accused, Revelation chapter 12 says he is, his title is called what? The accuser of the brethren. He's going to accuse you of how badly you failed Jesus, how much he can't love you, how lousy you are at your Christian walk. He is condemning you. Now the Holy Spirit will convict you as a parent, as one who will instruct and help guide you to understand how to do better. But there's not a conviction, there's an education in it. So we must identify, 
Many of you are walking around under such condemnation because the voice coming back to you is continually condemning you for what you failed to do or you did and you didn't do well. Of course, there's the third voice, and that's our own attitude, right? And so you've got to discern. You've got to discern the voice. You've got to discern the action. I don't know how many times uh, uh, the enemy will try and rob you of the good things of God. Let's take a worship service, for example, and your mind is wide open to what's going on, right? And you're being stressed about something, and you're trying to worship God, and you can't. And so the voice comes and says, look at you trying to worship God. All these people are holy and righteous, and you're the only one here with that kind of a problem. And you look around and you see halos around people and they're all glorious and they're amazing and awesome saints of God. And you sit in here (laughs) smelling like a sinner. Where's that coming from? Right? One of the most freeing experiences, I've shared this before, but one of the most freeing experiences for me was I grew up in church, but I never experienced Pentecostal worship. Once I got into Pentecostal worship, it began to open my heart to being before God at all times. And I remember praying and worshiping God. And um, I don't know, I'd, I'd see this beautiful woman over here, or I'd smell perfume or something like that. And out of the flashcards of my brain would come some picture as a teenager that I shouldn't have put in. And I'm in worship, and I'm going like, I'm sorry, don't look at that. Oh, my goodness, I'm sorry. Just flashed into my head. And I'm thinking, God's going like, oh, my gosh, what are you doing here? And the devil would come on me and go, you're a wretch, you're a loser. And I'd chase after the devil. You get away from me. I didn't, no, no, God, help me. Please forgive me. Worship was like a workout for me. By the time worship was over, I'm sweating, and it's like, oh, that didn't feel good at all. I feel worse than I ever was. Till I realized, as Paul says, there is nothing good within me that is in my flesh. This is where you must separate yourself and identify the problem. That rogue thought that came in was a wrong thought, a wrong image. Yeah, it got put in me by me. But it's not what I want. It's not what my true self wants. And when I learned to separate myself from it, I didn't have to wrestle it all afternoon or all evening in a worship service or chase the devil. I simply had to say, Father, I reject that. That's out of my flesh and there's no good thing in it. I love you. I felt no condemnation. I felt no rejection. But I did what Paul did. Separate and identify that is not me. Does this make sense to you? When the voices come, identify it. That is not from me. That's from my accuser. I reject it. Or that is from my flesh, and that flesh is just trying to get something from me. I don't want it. I'm looking to Jesus. I need to hear the voice of Jesus. And so we have to have the Word of God in us to hear the voice of Jesus. Does this make sense to you? Amen. So we put God's instruction and God's word in us so that we can call upon it to drown out the other words. This is just practical application. Last of all, an action is necessary. If you find a root problem, if you find what the identify with if it's the enemy or if it's your voice or if it's God, you need to then take captive of it. Take captive anything that exalts itself above the knowledge of Christ. So how do I take it captive? You can't take something captive if you can't identify it. You can't arrest an enemy if you don't know who the enemy is. So that's why it's important to understand what the problem is, what's the voice saying, and how I can take it captive. I can take any voice of the enemy captive because I know it's contrary to the Word of God. And we are not putting the word of God in us enough, we're not living by the word of God enough. We're living by our emotions and by our opinions too much. And we're listening to the counsel of the world. When will we get to the place to understand that the counsel of the world is wrong? I was absolutely devastated today. 
Yes, I was. I was devastated today. My wife told me. She just shattered my world. She told me today she was reading an article about Andy Griffith. And that, you know, the, the kindergartner teacher on Andy Griffith? Helen? Yeah, Helen Crump. They were having an affair. Andy Griffith? This is Andy and Mayberry. That's my go-to when I want to go to heaven. And it's a small town and everything's great in Mayberry. And everybody's fine. You got fried chicken and Andy's playing guitar and Barney's just silly and I can walk down the street. Andy Griffith, Mayberry was my special place. And I just found out it was corrupt and sinful. <laughs> I'm being silly, but it actually did impact me. <laughs> what it did show me is that there's nothing in this world <laughs> that is honest and true. Not even Mayberry. Are you crushed? I was crushed. Come on, Andy. All I'm saying is, how long are you and I, it's getting so bizarre now, how long are we going to take our counsel from the world? We cannot. I feel, and again, our children don't know anything any better. Our children growing up right now have no idea of what moral and sexual purity is. You can't find that anywhere. We had a knowledge of it, and we've seen it taken away. They've never had it unless they're being taught at home. And they're being retaught at their schools, something completely different. So what I'm saying is this. We've got to take action, and the action we're going to take is going to sound stupid and completely different than the world. And we can't listen to them anymore. So what action... We have to take captive wrong ideologies, wrong thoughts, and know that they are the voice that is not of the Lord. We need to either repent or renounce it or resist it. We can't play with it anymore. If you find out what the root of the problem is, you find out where the voice is coming from, you have to either repent from your own sin. I did. I'm stopping at stop signs over here. Uh, you have to renounce or reject what you used to believe and realize, no, that's wrong. Renounce it. Or you have to resist it. I'm not going there anymore. There's got to be an action. John the Baptist said that we, he, when he would baptize people, he'd baptize them in repentance. And he would bring them out of the water and he would say, therefore bring forth the fruit of repentance. Does anybody know what that would mean? The fruit of repentance. Like pomegranates, pears, oranges. What is he talking about? The change. The fruit is a byproduct. So if you really are repenting, there should be a manifestation, fruit, of the change. That's what's got to take place. So... I'm going to repent of this thing that I'm not going to do it anymore. I've changed my mind on it. The devil, I'm closing the door on this thing. How many of you have tried to quit a particular sin? You've tried over and over to stop it. You tried to stop this or stop that. You, and the true repentant mind is I'm done and I'm going to bear the fruit that shows I'm done. Now watch, be careful, because when you fail, then the devil's going to say, you're a loser, you said you were going to and you couldn't. Then your flesh is going to say, I'm so rotten, I'll never be any good. But you listen to the voice of God and you say, thank you, Jesus, for grace, by which I stand, and I'll get up, and I'm going to bear the fruit of repentance. Amen? This is a war. This is a war. This is the art of war. This will take place... Until you breathe your last breath. All right? Nobody arrives. Nobody gets, oh, yeah, I had that problem. <laughs> I had a sin problem for the first 10 years, but now I never do anymore. You're nuts. <laughs> That's reason talking. <laughs> be aware that we're going to be in a battle and a battle and a battle. 
And what God does is he takes you from victory to victory, glory to glory. What he's going to do is he's going to get you to be victor over this situation. But then once you have a celebration, guess what's coming? Revelation of the next problem. But you can do this with him because he's going to guide you into all truth. So we are constantly in a battle. Let's bow our heads.